Hello, and welcome back to another lecture video. My name is Carlos Brown Francia, and today we are going to be learning about the lungs. Now, each lung is separated into different parts. For instance, the left lung is separated into two parts, as you can see here. There is the superior lobe and the inferior lobe. The right lung is a bit different, because here you have three different sections. Uh, notice that I've taken out two of the sections to make room for more of a, well, for educational purposes. But for the right lung, you will have three different lobes. So there is the superior lobe, the middle lobe, and the inferior lobe. Now the reason why the right lung has more lobes is because typically the right lung is a little bit larger. The reason why the right lung is so large is because the left lung is being pressed on by the heart. So here we have this little wavy shape right there. And this wavy shape is called the cardiac notch. And it's just kind of where the heart rests its head on the left lung. And because the heart leans on the left lung, the left lung is a little smaller. The right lung is a, li a little bit larger than the left lung. Each lung is entrapped, it's closed by a membrane similar to that of the heart. So the heart was enclosed by a bag called the pericardium. The lungs are enclosed by a bag that is called the pleura. So the pleura surround the lungs. So we have the parietal pleura, which is the topmost portion. Here is called the coastal part. It's also called the parietal. If we hide this, we notice that there is a very thin membrane. Now, between the parietal membrane and this membrane, there is a cavity. There is a gap. And this gap is called the pleural cavity. And this pleural cavity has pleural fluid, very similar to that of the pericardium. So the pleural fluid helps maintain surface tension. So when the lungs breathe in and out, they breathe in and out, you want surface tension so that when you exhale, the lungs don't fully collapse. They have their same shape. Later on in this video, the, we will learn that the pleural fluid actually drives the force of motion when we breathe. So the lungs themselves, they don't actually move. They just facilitate the air. So it's kind of like a little balloon. The balloon doesn't move, but when you blow into the balloon, the balloon expands. There is no muscle in that balloon. The parietal fluid, along with the, interco the intercostal muscles, these muscles right here, and the diaphragm, that actually helps facilitate ventilation or breathing. Anyways, so between the pleural membranes, we have this pleural cavity. Now, on the exterior, we have the parietal pleural membrane. And then, on the inside, we have the innermost pleural membrane. And this innermost pleural membrane is called the visceral membrane, the visceral pleura. Now, the reason why we have this vis visceral pleura is because when we're breathing, the lungs will expand and they will contract but when they expand, they'll be pressing against the ribs, which is not shown here. They will be pressing against the muscle. They will be pressing against the diaphragm. They will be pressing against the heart. And you don't want the lungs to be pressing against other organs because then they will become irritated, and that's not good. However, when we have a decrease in pleural fluid, we can have the pleural membranes rubbing against each other, and it's kind of like rubbing sandpaper together. It's very irritating. That's the sound of the, uh, the pleural membranes rubbing against each other. And when that happens, we have chest pain, and that's called pleurisy. So sometimes a person might present to you and they say, hey, I have chest pain and it hurts even more when I breathe. When I take a deep breath in and I take a deep breath out, my chest hurts. So you may be thinking of heart attack, and that's always a good thing to be aware of, but you should also be thinking of pleurisy, which is when the pleural membranes rub against each other. Now, before I move on from the pleural membranes, 
I want to mention that the pleural fluid, the fluid be between the pleural membranes, that is created by the methothelial cells, methothelial cells. It is the same type of cell within the pericardium or the pericardial cavity that creates this fluid. So the mesothelial cells create this fluid. And periodically this fluid is recycled because you can't have the same fluid in the in the same area. It's like changing the oil out of your car. You can have the oil in your car, but you just have to change it out every now and then. The mesothelial cells monitor the levels of the pleural fluid, pleural cavity fluid, and they create more fluid. Now, when we go into the inferior portion of the lungs, we notice that we have this weird shelf-looking muscle. And this shelf-looking muscle is actually called the diaphragm. It is the diaphragm. It is the main muscle that is facilitating the act of ventilation, the act of breathing. So this muscle is going to flatten out. Right now, it's more like an M shape. But when we're done with it, it almost looks like a straight line with a, a little curve at the middle so it will contract it will contract and this contraction will push the lungs away from each other and they will be allowed to fill when we breathe in the diaphragm contracts and these intercostal muscles that are attached to the ribs they will expand outwards so this guy right here will flatten this way flatten right there and the intercostal muscles will expand outwards and this allows the lungs to expand to the maximum potential and this muscle is going to be using acetylcholine acetylcholine like the skeletal muscles to create that contraction so the acetylcholine will be released from the synapse and is going to bind into the postsynaptic center it is going to allow sodium to rush into the cell and facilitate the opening of calcium channels and that allows the muscles to contract and when we release this acetylcholine this acetylcholine we have to get rid of it using acetylcholinesterase and that gets rid of the acetylcholine which uh, decreases the amount of sodium which decreases the amount of calcium which will decrease the amount of contraction and this has to be tightly regulated because if you have too much acetylcholine, you have too much contraction, and the lungs can no longer um, expand or uh, shrink. And so this is actually really bad. And I want to speak out about something, because if we never talk about it, we will forget it. There are different nerve gases in this world. One of them is the VX gas. VX gas. And VX gas is an acetylcholinesterase blocker. And so it will get rid of the enzyme that lowers the concentration of acetylcholine. And when that happens, you will have a spasm of the diaphragm and it will keep contracting. And the person, the victim of this poisoning, is going to breathe like this. <sighs> until they stop breathing and unfortunately they die in a few minutes and so one of the greatest atrocities in this world um, would have to be Edgewood training facilities in Maryland from 1950 up until the 1970s and that is when the American government would get Vietnam um, veterans they would get people who fought in Korea and they would take them to the Edgewood facility for training for experiments on different types of gases and drugs like LSD and VX gas and unfortunately the personnel, the victims as we call them, they were not informed about what was happening. They would be injected with about 10 times the amount of normal dosage for LSD just to see what would happen. Uh, you would have people taking gas masks uh, non-rebreathers typically use them for oxygen and they would instead be inhaling VX gas without the knowledge of what it was and so you had this person inhaling VX gas and they would start spasming they would start having hypoxic episodes and a lot of them died and, and, and frankly it's a medical atrocity it's a violation of human rights and a violation of medical ethics and so we have to talk about that when we talk about the respiratory system because we can't do that. It's wrong. And when you practice medicine, when you get into medical school, or whatever you do in life, just know that people have lives and they have families and people who love them. 
and um, to never hurt anybody. When you're dealing with a nerve agent like VX gas, you always treat them with atropine first, and then you wean them off of atropine and shift them into 2-PAM, which is another acetylcholinesterase. So atropine will take rid of, it will get rid of the acetylcholine. 2-PAM is another um, medication that will get rid of the acetylcholine buildup. And you also give them Valium, ditiazem, so that the body relaxes. Because right now you're having a lot of spasms, you want the body to relax, and so you would give Valium to the person, usually via IV, because they're shaking so much and they're breathing so rapid that they can't take any oral medication. Moving back into the lungs, we notice that the trachea will kind of branch out into the lungs. This portion right here is called the carina, and it's filled with a lot of nerves. So if any food or water or any foreign object enters this region, you will start having a coughing fit you will cough automatically. automatically, And so that kind of gives us a, a way to think of the lungs. The lungs are controlled via the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system. So you don't really think, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. You don't think that. It just happens naturally. Now don't worry about all of this picture. Don't worry about it. I just want you to know that the lungs are innervated by the autonomic nervous system and they have a combination of parasympathetic innervation and sympathetic innervation. For the parasympathetic innervation, that's when we are relaxed. So when we're just in the house eating a burrito or whatever you're eating, we're relaxed. Everything is normal. Everything is fine. When we are relaxed, we are receiving inputs from this cranial nerve called the vagus nerve, and it's actually the 10th nerve right here. So it is part of the parasympathetic innervation, the parasympathetic innervation. When the parasympathetic innervation activates in the lungs, it will constrict the bronchioles. It will constrict the bronchi. And it's not exaggerated. It's just going to reduce the amount of air intake that you do. So you don't need that much air because you're not running from a bear. You're not running from a cheetah or from the IRS or from anatomy class or whatever you're running from. You're not doing that. If you were running, that would be called the sympathetic innervation. So the sympathetic uh, system, that's going to dilate, it's going to increase the diameter of this bronchi, of the bronchioles as well. And by the way, when the bronchi meet the lungs at this area, this is called the hilum. The hilum is just the insertion point of the bronchi into the lungs. And nerves and capillaries, they also meet at the lungs, and the meeting point is called the hilum, H-I-L-U-M, hilum. So when we are activated by the sympathetic nervous system, the bronchi diameter also increases in width. It increases in width. And so do the bronchioles. And before I remove this picture, not only is the vagus nerve stimulating the lungs, but the lungs also receive input from the thoracic nerves. Thoracic nerves, and that's not shown here. But some nerves from the thoracic region will come and, in, and insert into the lungs and send signals from the brain into the lungs. Now we have to talk about three different teammates when we're talking about ventilation, which is breathing. So we talked about the fluid inside the pleural cavity. Now the fluid is going to not only give us surface tension, but it's also going to allow us to facilitate ventilation. And I'll tell you why. Here, when we are breathing in, so when we breathe in, the lungs expand and they go outwards, going towards my cursor, outwards. The pleural fluid is going to always point in the left direction in this picture right here. So it's always going to be pointing towards the ribs. And that allows for the expansion of the lungs. But if we're always pointing towards the ribs, wouldn't we always be expanding? That is true. 
And so we need a force that is directly opposite, that is pointing towards, let's say, uh, in this example, let's say it's pointing towards the trachea. All right, just an example. It's not actually doing that, but for this example, we'll say it's pointing directly away from the ribs. And that force is within the alveoli. Within the alveoli, we have this fluid that is being produced by the what? By the type 2 alveolar cells, and it is called surfactant. Now, the surfactant also provides surface tension for the alveola, and it will also facilitate in ventilation, in which the surface tension or the surfactant is going to produce a force that is opposite to the force being produced by the pleural fluid. And so we have one force going towards the left, that's the pleural fluid force, and we have another force pointing towards the right, pointing towards the, let's say, trachea. And that is the alveolar fluid, the surfactant. Now, while this is all happening, while this tug of war is happening, every time we breathe in and out, in and out, the muscles between the ribs they're called the intercostal muscles, and we have two sets. We have the external intercostal muscles, and then we have the innermost. We have the innermost, this region right here. We have the innermost intercostal muscles, and we also have this little in-between. So that's the intercostal muscles right there. So external and innermost intercostal muscles. So when we take a deep breath in, the diaphragm will flatten out and it will uh, kind of spread these lungs apart as they expand. And then as we inhale, the intercostal muscles will go upwards and outwards and that will facilitate inspiration, inhalation of air. When we exhale, the diaphragm is going to contract and form this M shape and the external intercostal muscles are going to compress and that's going to squeeze as much air from the lungs as is safe as possible. And so breathing or ventilation is between three or really four different groups. We have the pleural fluid, the alveolo uh, alveolar surfactant, the intercostal muscles, both the external and internal and intercostal muscles, and the diaphragm. And that allows the pressure in the lungs to uh, change as we breathe. More volume in the lungs means less pressure. And less pressure means that the pressure on the outside is going to rush into the lungs because a high pressure on the outside will follow a low pressure system. But Brian, what do you mean by that? And Brian, can you actually uh, show us how that's done? Well, I'm glad you asked. So before we even start, we have to know that when we're breathing in, the pressure around us, like we're walking in a park or something, the air pressure is the pressure that the air has on your body. So at any given moment, there is a little bit of weight being pushed on you by the air around you. And that is called the atmospheric pressure. And that is 760 millimeters of mercury. So it's a little bit of math in this concept, but just know that there is more pressure on the outside of your body than there is pressure in your lungs. So here, we're going to be using this box as a lung. And here, let's say that we have a small lung, and we're going to pump in some oxygen. Okay, so notice that we have some pressure right there. Now, when I have this pressure, if I inflate my lungs to a larger volume, now look at the pressure meter, it goes from 70 atmospheres into 36 atmospheres. So the more volume in the lungs, the less pressure there is. Now likewise, if I have all this oxygen in my lungs and I'm fully inflated, when I exhale, I'm going to be decreasing the amount of volume in my lungs. And that's going to do what? It's going to increase the pressure. It's going to increase the pressure. So let's kind of let's kind of get rid of all this right here. Let's get rid of all these guys. Okay. So likewise, if I have all this oxygen 
and then I quickly exhale, I'm going to decrease the amount of volume in my lungs. I go from 35 atmospheres into 105. And so we learn that the more volume there is in a container, the less pressure there is. The less volume in the container, the more pressure there is. So when we increase the volume of our lungs, when we inhale, we're decreasing the amount of pressure in our lungs. Why do we want that? Well, we always want the lungs during inhalation to have a decreased pressure because the outside air from our bodies, let's say just the air around the house or whatever, it goes from a high gradient, a high level, into a low level. So that high pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury is going to go into the lungs naturally. And when we exhale, we decrease the amount of volume in the lungs and that's going to increase the amount of pressure in the lungs. So we go from a high pressure in the lungs into the lower pressure of the outside. So we take on all that air and we shove it out into the world very naturally and that is a high pressure going into a low pressure and it will always happen. If we take that concept of pressure and we apply it to the structures inside the lungs, we will notice that the alveolar sacs has something called the intraalveolar pressure. And initially, when we begin breathing, initially this pressure inside the alveola is zero, and the external pressure of the atmosphere is 760. And so we go from a high pressure to a low pressure. So the air will naturally want to go inside the lungs and fill up the alveolar space. And when that happens, very quickly, the alveolar pressure goes from zero to 760. So eventually we will become an equilibrium to the atmospheric pressure and that drives the process of ventilation. Now when we exhale the alveolar sacs, the pressure within the intraalveolar space will go from 760 all the way down to zero. So it went from a high pressure system to a low pressure system yet again. And that is kind of the facilitation of ventilation within the alveolar sacs. And you will notice that the pleural cavity is going to have something called intrapleural pressure. And the intrapleural pressure is always going to be lower than the atmospheric pressure. So that's also going to help air be driven into the lungs because the intrapleural pressure is lower than the atmospheric pressure. But notice that the intrapleural pressure is always going to be lower than the intraalveolar pressure. So when the intraalveolar pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, so when we are maximally inhaled, it will be 760. When we, ex when we inhale maximally, the intrapleural pressure is going to be 756. So even when we inhale, the pressure within the intrapleural space is 756. That is still lower than the maximum amount of 760 found within the intraalveolar. So that is going to create a force that drives away from the lungs. It points towards the ribs and that allows for us to expand our lungs. It allows for us to expand our lungs. When we exhale, we will eventually hit zero pressure in the alveola. But when we exhale, we will hit a negative four on the intrapleural pressure. What does that mean? Well, negative four is a lot less than, ne uh, than, than zero, I, I hope. I'm not really good at math. I'm good at math, then I would be a mathematician, but I'm not, okay? I'm not Einstein, I'm not that smart. But I know that negative four is a lot less than zero. And so still, this pressure difference between the intrapleural pressure and the intraalveolar pressure allows the lungs to not fully collapse. It allows us to not fully collapse. So when we completely exhale, we're not collapsing our lungs and that would be very deadly. So what I want to say is the intrapleural pressure is very important because when we inhale to the maximum amount, that allows us to expand our lungs to the best capacity because we are still a little bit less than the atmospheric pressure. When we completely exhale, we hit zero pressure in the alveola, but we have an even lower pressure in the intrapleural membrane. And that kind of allows us to 
not fully collapse the lungs. So it has this force that pulls the lungs towards the ribs and that facilitates breathing and it prevents the lungs from collapsing. And before I leave this image, the transpulmonary pressure really is just the intraalveolar pressure minus the intrapleural pressure. And the larger this number is, the larger the lungs. So if we have more width, we would have more intraalveolar pressure. So somebody's lungs like, let's say Shaq or Michael Jordan, they have very large lungs uh, compared to my lungs. So I barely have the lung capacity to blow out a candle and their lungs would be a lot larger than my lungs. And so their transpulmonary pressure would be a larger number, maybe 12 compared to my two or one. And I will mention this, the inspiration, the inhalation of oxygen or of air does take energy because we are using this diaphragm to contract. We're using this diaphragm to expand the thoracic cavity and that takes energy. It takes ATP. But when we exhale, that action is, well, it's mainly passive. And so it's passive because the lungs itself, the lungs itself is actually elastic. So the lungs are elastic and they will kind of do like a rubber band effect. And so when you take this rubber band and you stretch it all the way out, that takes energy from your body. But when you snap it back together, the, the rubber bands snap in place quickly with no energy input. And so the lungs expand, and when the diaphragm relaxes, the lungs snap back into the original placement. And that is a very passive action. It doesn't need energy to exhale. And speaking of breathing, we have different types of breathing. We have four different types. So we have the normal breathing, which is called quiet breathing. Here's me quiet breathing. No, very quiet. And that's just a breathing that you do almost 90% of the day. So it's just normal breathing. It's automatic. It's quiet and it requires the intercostal muscles and also the diaphragm so it's just your normal everyday breathing then we have the diaphragmatic breathing and the diaphragmatic breathing is called a deep breath so it's something like this So it's a little bit deeper than a normal quiet breath. And that requires the diaphragm. So it requires the diaphragm for it to happen. And usually it is somatic. So it actually says, hey, I have to tell myself to breathe in deeply. So let's say you're having a panic attack and you need to meditate. You need to take a deep breath. You need to stop and say positive things in your head and to deep uh, to, to breathe deeply so you go and you hold it and then that is a diaphragmatic breathing style and it requires the diaphragm next we have the coastal breathing and that is the shallow breathing so that's kind of like very quick breaths like let's say you're scared and you're panicking you're, you're panicking you have this breathing style like this <laughs> So it's very quick, it's very shallow, you don't have a lot of oxygen or air coming into the lungs, you have a lot of air moving out of the lungs in a quick fashion. And mainly that is just the intercostal muscles contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. There's hardly any movement within the diaphragm. So that is not a lot of air being, being uh, placed in and out of the lungs. And that could lead to hyperventilation in which you don't have enough oxygen coming in, but you have a lot of carbon dioxide building up. And so that could cause a fainting spell for a person. But that is an example of coastal breathing. And finally, we have forced breathing. So that's if I completely stop breathing and then I inhale as much air as I possibly can and I maximize the volume inside the lungs. And that is called hyperapnea.
hypernea, like pneumonia, P-N-E-A, hypernea. And, and a good example of this would be like exercising, like I'm running a marathon or I'm on the elliptical machine. Well, I'm taking these forced breathings. I'm doing this forced breathing style. Or if I'm running away from a chihuahua or a toddler, I'm going to be forcing my breath into the lungs. And it's always somatic. I always have to tell myself to breathe in deeply when I do this. And both the intercoastal muscles and the diaphragm muscle are involved in forced breathing. But not only that, but you also have the accessory muscles. So not pictured here are the muscles within the neck. And when you take a very, very deep breath, the neck muscles will contract. So you can take a deep breath right now and you can put your hand next to your jugular, next to your neck, and you can feel your muscles kind of contract as your thorax, as your chest expands outwards. And if you have abs, I, I don't have abs, unfortunately, but if you had abs, these abs would also kind of contract this way. They would contract towards the organs and that pushes the organs upwards and that pushes on the diaphragm and the diaphragm pushes on the lungs to further contract and to force out as much air as possible. And so the oblique muscles, the ab muscles also help in the forced breathing. So the obliques would be a good example of an accessory muscle in forced breathing. So since we just talked about the respiratory types, we also need to talk about the respiratory volumes. And here we're going to have the tidal volume. So the tidal volume, the tidal volume, that's just the normal volume that you breathe in. So when I'm talking to you right now, I'm talking to you using the tidal volume. And typically that's about 500, it's about 500 milliliters of oxygen. So 500 milliliters of air, let's say. And that's typical for a person. So that's just me speaking normally. Now here we have the expiratory reserve volume. And that's just how much air I can normally force out if I do this. So imagine that you're in a public swimming pool. You're doing normal tidal volume as you walk into the diving board. As you walk into the diving board, you're gonna take a deep breath out. Well, you went, you went immediately from tidal volume into the expiratory reserve volume. So expiratory just means to exhale. So as you are preparing to jump from the diving board, you exhale fully. You don't take a deep breath and then you exhale. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. You walk into the diving board and you exhale so you go from tidal volume immediately into the expiratory reserve volume. And that's usually about 1200, 1200 milliliters. For the inspiratory reserve volume, that is the exact opposite of the expiratory reserve volume. So every time I teach, I cut the video into segments. And before that segment begins, I go from tidal volume into the inspiratory volume because I take a very deep breath in to calm myself because I'm a very nervous person and I often cut the videos into segments because I stutter a lot and I mess up or I say something incorrect and I have to correct myself. And so I go from a normal tidal volume, which is just me talking, and I do the inspiratory reserve volume. That is the maximum amount of volume of air that I can have in my lungs. So I go from tidal volume and I do this. And I hold it. And that is the inspiratory reserve volume. So that is the max, max ML of oxygen or air in the lungs. For the vital capacity, that's just the maximum amount of air in the lungs at any given time. So it goes from the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. So that's really just IRV plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. So let's say that again, you're going to go on the diving board. So you're on the diving board, you're kind of bouncing around before you jump off 
you take a deep breath in and then you hit the diving board you bounce up and then you are in the air and you exhale so you go completely until there's no air in your lungs and you hit the water and you do a cannonball so this vital capacity is the maximum amount of air in your lungs and for men for men the vital capacity is usually about six liters for women the vital capacity is usually about 4.2 liters. Now, in that same vein of thought, you know that the lungs never fully collapse unless they are punctured. And if it is punctured, that is a critical emergency. But the lungs are never fully collapsed. They will always have some level of oxygen or air in them. And that is called the residual volume. That is called the residual volume and the residual volume prevents the lungs from collapsing. In the brain, the way that we breathe is controlled by multiple centers. So how fast we breathe, how deeply we breathe, how deeply we exhale, that is controlled by the brain. And specifically, is going to be controlled by the medulla, medulla oblongata, and also the pons. Now, the medulla oblongata is going to be split into two different sections. It's going to be split into the dorsal respiratory group and also the ventral respiratory group. In anatomy, it's always a good idea to think of ventral as relating to the organs or to the flesh. And so this guy right here is going to control, he's going to control the diaphragm, diaphragm and also the intercostal muscles. So it's going to control the intercostal muscles. So we're going to call that rib muscles to save time on writing. The other section of the medulla is called the dorsal respiratory group. So the dorsal faces the spine. And what does the spine have? The spine has a lot of nerves. So this guy has nerves. And this is going to force the muscles of the accessory, so like the, the, the neck and the obliques, is going to innervate those accessory muscles into contraction. And that allows us to kind of do the forced breathing. So it's going to nerve the accessory muscles, and I don't know how to say accessory muscles, so we're just gonna say accessory, sorry. I don't care if that's spelled correctly, but who cares? Accessory muscles contract, and that's going to increase inspiration. And that right there is just called forced breathing. And that's by the dorsal respiratory group. Now the ventral group, again, that's going to control the diaphragm and the rib muscles, the intercostal muscles, and that's going to force them to contract. And when those muscles contract, that just allows us to breathe normally. When the ventral respiratory group stops sending signals, the muscles no longer contract and they start to relax. And that's going to shrink the thoracic cavity and that pushes the lungs to exhale. The dorsal respiratory group, again, that's going to cause the accessory muscles to contract and to allow us to inhale forcefully, like that. And when they stop sending signals, well, guess what? The accessory muscles stopped contracting and they start relaxing. And that allows us to do a forced um, exhalation. So like this. And that comes from the dorsal respiratory group. Now, the next section is called the pons. So this is the pons respiratory system. So we have the pontine respiratory system. Prior, we were talking about the medullary respiratory system, but now we're talking about the pontine. And the pontine respiratory system has two groups. It has the pneumotaxic center, and it also has the apnostic center. So the apnostic center is going to limit how far we exhale. So when we exhale, the depth, the depth right here, so we have the apnostic center, is going to control 
control the exhalation, exhalation depth. So we don't exhale forever. We have a limit, and that limit is set by the apnostic center. Now the pneumotaxic center is going to be inhibitory. So the pneumotaxic center, so we have the pneumotaxic center is going to inhibit the dorsal respiratory group, the dorsal respiratory group. And that's going to cause the lungs to relax after we forcefully inhale. So it relaxes lungs. In total, the pontine respiratory group is going to adjust or it's going to control, control the actions of the medulla. And that is an exclamation mark. When we are breathing, we are also sending signals to this dorsal respiratory group. What kind of signals are we sending? So the signals that we're sending have to be the stretch receptors. So stretch receptors. So for instance, when we're exercising, we take in more air from the atmosphere. We breathe in deeply. And that's going to stretch the respiratory system. So like, let's say the diaphragm muscles, they kind of contract or the intercostal muscles also contract and they stretch. But also the linings of the pulmonary system stretch. And when that happens, the muscles send a signal to the dorsal respiratory group. So dorsal relates to the nerves and they sense all the senses coming in from the body. And we also have the chemo, chemo receptors. So if the body senses that there's a high concentration of carbon dioxide, we're gonna try to breathe more because if we breathe more, we take in more air, which means more oxygen, and we can take out more carbon dioxide. And so chemoreceptors and stretch receptors will communicate with the dorsal respiratory group, and that will allow us to adjust our breathing rate. It will allow us to breathe in more deeply and it will allow us to reduce the carbon dioxide concentration or increase the pH, which we will talk about later in this video. Now, not pictured here are two groups that regulate the respiratory system. So we have the aortic, aortic body, and we also have the carotid, carotid, carotid body. And what they do is that they will monitor, they will monitor the pressure. So we're gonna have P for pressure, the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, the pressure of oxygen in the blood, and also the concentration of hydrogen, also known as the pH. So the aortic body and the carotid body are other respiratory centers that monitor the pressure of the carbon dioxide and the pressure of the oxygen and also the concentration of uh, hydrogen inside the blood and the body will adjust the respiratory rate accordingly. Within the brain we have another structure and that structure is called the hypo, hypothalamus. Thalamus. And what this does is that it will regulate our emotions and it will also regulate the body temperature. It will regulate the body temperature. Body temp. So let's say that we just watched a scary movie or we're walking in a dark alley and we hear a noise behind us. Well, our body starts getting scared and we start breathing quickly. And when we breathe quickly, that's automatic. We don't have to tell ourselves to breathe quickly, but that process is controlled by the hypothalamus. If you're hot, let's say you're driving to California and you're in Arizona and it's very hot and you drive a, an old car and the air condition doesn't work because your mom says, oh, you know, you don't need air conditioning, you don't need windshield wiper fluid or whatever. Well, you do because you're going to be very hot in Arizona and you're almost going to have this heat stroke and then you're going to make a lecture video talking about the time you almost had heat stroke and that's very fun 
memory to relive. But anyways, when you have too much heat in your body, the hypothalamus is going to regulate the body temperature and is going to try to exhale that hot air from the body. So it's kind of like a dog when it's been running outside, it goes inside the house and it starts panting <laughs> so it can take away all that hot air from the body. It, essentially all the, the heat from the body is leaving via the respiratory system. So the hypothalamus will sense that the body's too hot and it will, start, it will try to ventilate, it will try to release that hot breath into the world. And your emotions can also play a part. So if you're scared, you start breathing in deeply. If you're angry, you also breathe in quickly. Now all around here, all over the brain is called the cortex. So that is the cortex. And the cortex is just going to control voluntary, voluntary breathing. So a large majority of your brain is just kind of preoccupied with controlling your voluntary breathing, like taking a deep breath in right now and exhaling it right now. The cortical area, the cortex of the brain, kind of like the folds of the brain that looks like chewed up gum, that controls the voluntary breathing. You also have the proprietary receptors. So we have the pro prior receptors. And that kind of goes with muscle movement, muscle movement. So let's say you're at the gym and you start exercising. When you begin exercising, your muscles send a signal that says, hey, we're moving. I don't know why we're moving, but we're moving right now. So we're gonna send these signals to the proprior receptors. And the proprior receptors will send that signal into the brain. And it says, hey, we're moving a lot, or maybe we're running or we're lifting something heavy. I don't know why we're lifting something heavy, but I do know that we need more oxygen in the body. And so we need to increase, we need to increase the respiratory rate, respiratory rate. And so when the proprietor receptors send their signals, they will increase the respiratory rate, which equals more oxygen going into the body. When the proprietor receptors reduce their signals, they will decrease the respiratory rate, which will decrease the oxygen concentration in the blood. And finally, we have something called the inflation reflex. We have something called the in inflation, inflation reflex. Oop, we have the reflex. And that's going to prevent the overinflation of the lungs. So it prevents, prevents over, over in inflation. So you don't want to keep inhaling and inhaling until the lungs literally pop. You don't want to do that because then that will cause the lungs to burst. And here's a quick aside. Um, sometimes you will have people go into the ER and I've seen this and I've seen it on x-rays as well. When they're about to enter a car accident, they automatically inhale deeply as a brace for impact. And when they brace for impact, they get hit in the back of the car and their chest hits the steering wheel. Now that force from the steering wheel goes into the chest and since we have an inflated lung, that force goes into the inflated lung and it causes a burst lung. It's kind of like filling up a balloon and then putting your hand on it until it pops. And that is not a good thing. 
as a very terrible thing and I've seen it in person and it's very graphic. So the inflation reflex prevents the overinflation of the lungs naturally. So it has a limit of how far we can inflate the lungs. In the body, what drives us to breathe is not the lack of oxygen, but rather it is the concentration of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. So we're going to be using the chemo, chemo receptors, receptors. And again, we're going to have two types of chemo receptors. We have the central chemo receptors. So we have the central, central chemo receptors, and we also have the peripheral, peripheral peripheral central chemoreceptors and peripheral chemoreceptors now the central chemoreceptors are located in the brain stem so we have the brain stem and really the brain in total so we have the brain and the peripheral one is located in the aortic in the aortic system and also in the carotid carotid so you can kind of think of this as in the vessels. So what happens here is that in the central chemoreceptors, we're going to call that central chemoreceptors, as the concentration of carbon dioxide increases, it will readily go into the brain. So it's going to start accumulating within the blood-brain barrier. So it's going to accumulate in the blood-brain barrier. And now the central chemoreceptors are going to sense that there is an increase in carbon dioxide. So let's say that we're holding our breaths. As we hold our breaths, the tissues are doing their respiratory um, me metabolic pathways. And a byproduct of this metabolic pathway is going to be carbon dioxide. So let's say you're exercising and you're holding your breath. Well, the levels of carbon dioxide is going to increase. And when that happens, it's going to diffuse into the blood-brain barrier, and the central chemoreceptors in the brain and brainstem are going to sense that there is carbon dioxide. And so it will send signals into the respiratory centers to increase the respiratory rate. So that's going to increase the respiratory rate, which increase the concentration of oxygen, which will then decrease the concentration of carbon dioxide. For the peripheral peripheral chemoreceptors, that's going to be located within the vessels. For a large part, they're located inside the vessels. So like the vessels in the carotid, the vessels in the aorta, the vessels in your veins and veins and arteries or whatever. So it's located in the vessels. And what happens here is that the vessels are going to sense that there is an increase in carbon dioxide. And when there is an increase in carbon dioxide, they're going to send a signal to the brain and the brain will increase the respiratory rate and that increases the concentration of oxygen and subsequently that's going to decrease the carbon dioxide concentration and so no matter what happens the chemoreceptors in relation to the respiratory system will always try to manage the concentration of carbon dioxide and it will adjust the respiratory rate so that we can have the best level of carbon dioxide and oxygen. But in addition to this, in addition to monitoring the carbon dioxide levels, the body also monitors, it also monitors the concentration of hydrogen, of hydrogen. And so if we have a high concentration of hydrogen, then we have an acidic level in the blood. An acidic level is going to be a decreased pH. So we're going to have a decrease in the concentration or the pH level. And so a pH of 4 is going to be more acidic than a pH of 7, for an example. So when do we have an increase in hydrogen concentration? When you're exercising, you're producing lactic, lactic acid. And lactic acid is going to increase the concentration of hydrogen, which again is going to decrease the pH level. And we don't want that. We don't want the body to have acidic blood. And also we don't want the body to have basic blood or alkaline blood. 
And so the peripheral chemoreceptors are going to sense that there's an increase in hydrogen and is going to, again, increase the respiratory rate to increase the concentration of oxygen. So that's why, you're, that's why when you're exercising, you're breathing heavily and you don't have to tell yourself to breathe heavily. The body is telling your body to, well, the body is telling itself <laughs> to increase the respiratory rate. And here is kind of a, a pro tip. The concentration of carbon dioxide if you have an increase in carbon dioxide concentration, then you will also have an increase in hydrogen concentration. So the more carbon dioxide that, the, that there is in the body, the more hydrogen concentration there is. So that must mean that we have to get rid of both of them to go back to a normal level. And we'll explain later why the increase in carbon dioxide leads to an increase in hydrogen. We will now be talking about gas diffusion. So we will talk about gas diffusion. So it's really how the blood receives oxygen and it deposits carbon dioxide. How does that work? Well, it all works via gradients. So we have pressure, pressure gradients. And all we need to know is that in pressure, we like to go from high to low. So it's kind of like when your mom tells you to clean your bedroom and instead of really cleaning your bedroom, you take all your stuff and you stuff it into your closet. So you shove all this pressure into one area and when you open that door again, all that high pressure goes into an area of low pressure. All that clutter goes all over your room when you open that closet door. So it goes from high pressure to low pressure and it does it naturally. You don't have to put your own energy into putting all the basketballs and the loose clothes and chihuahuas or whatever that you had in your room, you don't have to push it out um, when you open that closet door filled with a lot of garbage and stuff. And so the pressure gradient is the driving force for the gas diffusion. So here we have the blood capillary. Let's say that, and, and frankly, you don't want to work with numbers, you want to work with concepts. Let's say that you have uh, a pressure gradient of 104, 104 four millimeters of mercury of, let's say, oxygen right here. Compared to the blood, the blood right here has only 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. Well, there's a higher level of oxygen inside the alveola compared to the blood capillary. And so since we have a high pressure, we're gonna go from a high pressure to a low pressure. We go from a high number to a low number. We're gonna shove all these little oxygen molecules into the blood. So they're going to readily diffuse into the blood right there. Now let's make up a number for carbon dioxide. Let's say that we have a partial pressure of 60, 60 millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide inside this blood. What, and let's say that there's only 10 millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide inside the alveola. Well, again, we have a high pressure going into a low pressure. We have a high pressure of carbon dioxide going into a low pressure of carbon dioxide. And that is called diffusion. So again, this whole process is called diffusion. Diffusion. And that allows for the gas to be exchanged. It allows for new oxygen to go into the blood and transfer into the tissues of the body while getting rid of the carbon dioxide. And what we just described here is something that people like to call external, external respiration. So we have the respir, respiration. So external respiration is just the external environment allowing us to have respiration. So it is the exchange of gases between the body and the external atmosphere. That is external respiration. We also have this process occurring inside tissues. And when that happens, that is called internal respiration. Here we have the tissue cells meeting with the urethrocyte.
and let's say that we're exercising and here's the muscle cell so the concentration the concentration of oxygen inside this muscle cell is going to be decreased let's say that inside the muscle cell it's only a concentration of or rather it has a pressure of five five millimeters of mercury we're just making up numbers for the concept let's say that there's a very small pressure of oxygen well, this urethro urethrocyte just came from the lungs. And so the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be 100 millimeters of mercury. Well, all this oxygen is going to go into the tissue. We go from a high system into a low system. And so we see the readily diffused oxygen going into the tissue cells. Likewise, we can say that the pressure of carbon dioxide is going to be, let's say, is going to be 100 right there. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the urethrocyte is going to be 5. Because we just came from the lungs, and so there's not a lot of carbon dioxide inside the urethrocyte. Therefore, all this carbon dioxide inside the tissue cell is going to readily diffuse into the urethrocyte. And now, we have a high concentration of carbon dioxide inside the blood, and we can transport that carbon dioxide out into the uh, lungs, and the lungs will exhale that carbon dioxide out into the environment. And that is just called internal, that is called internal, internal respiration. Respiration. Because it occurs between the urethrocytes, the red blood cell, and the tissue inside the body. When we zoom in on an urethrocyte, we notice that the urethrocyte has thousands of these little guys right here. And these guys are called hemoglobin. These are called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin are created by four different subunits. We have the alpha-1 subunits, we have the alpha-2 subunits, we have the beta-1 subunit, and the beta-2 subunit. And each subunit has iron and that iron is called a heme group and each heme group is going to be connected to a molecule of oxygen and again the urethrocyte has thousands and thousands and thousands of hemoglobin and therefore we can hold thousands and thousands and thousands of molecules of oxygen technically one red blood cell can hold 1.2 billion, 1.2 billion, billion molecules of oxygen in just one red blood cell. It's very efficient. And when we look at the hemoglobin, we have to realize something very special with the hemoglobin. And what's special about hemoglobin is that the more oxygen we bind, the faster the other oxygen bind to the hemoglobin. So the more oxygen we bind to the hemoglobin, the easier it is for other oxygen molecules to bind to it. What do I mean by that? Well, if we have alpha-1 and alpha-2, and we also have beta-1 and also beta-2, let's say that we have an oxygen attached to alpha-1 and alpha-2. Well, now oxygen is going to say, hey, there's a party going on, and I'm not invited. I brought the Doritos, I brought the, the soda, I have the music, I want to join in, in on this party too. And so he's going to take his little oxygen-looking self over here to this urethrocyte, and he's going to join the party. And then the other oxygen says, hey, there's a huge party going on here, I really want to join. And so he's going to go into this other subunit, and now he is going to bind to it. But let's say that we have the alpha-1 subunit, and the alpha-2 subunit, and also the beta-1 and the beta-2, right there. And let's say that only one oxygen is bound here. Well, when we have one oxygen, this guy says, hey, this party kind of sucks. There's only one guy here, but I look over there and there's a another hemoglobin that has a bunch of oxygen. So why would I want to hang around here? This party 
is not good. Let me go somewhere else. Um, and let me just not bind to this hemoglobin. And so it's a lot easier for oxygen to bind if there's already a party going on. It's like, why would you show up to a person's party if you're the only person that's going to be there? It's kind of awkward. And you don't want to talk to them. You just want to have a party. You want to get some drinks in you. You don't want to converse with this stranger. The same thing happens here. And this relationship between the oxygen and the hemoglobin can be represented by a line graph, by really a curve. And this is called the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation graph. And what it shows is the affinity or the love of oxygen towards the hemoglobin. If we go towards the left portion, we're going to be called left shifted. And that must mean that the oxygen, oxygen loves the hemoglobin. But if we go towards the right, that is right shifted, well, what does that mean? It means that the oxygen, oxygen hates, it hates the hemoglobin. And that is a very cute, angry face. And so that must mean that the oxygen is going to stay with the hemoglobin on the left shifted portion. And on the right shifted portion, this means that the oxygen will go into the tissues easily. So the oxygen diffuses into the tissue easily. How do we math that out? How do, how do we represent that with mathematics? So if we have a partial pressure of 40 inside the tissues, inside the tissues right here, well, on the right shifted portion, that must mean that 60% of the oxygen inside the hemoglobin stays with the hemoglobin. And that must mean that the rest of the oxygen, the 40%, that's going to go towards the tissues. But, however, if we go towards the left shifted portion, if we go towards the left shifted portion, at a partial pressure of 40, what does that give us? So if we go to 40, instead of having 60% of oxygen staying with hemoglobin, instead, we have 80% of oxygen staying with hemoglobin. So now we have 80% of oxygen staying with hemoglobin if we use the left shifted scale. And that's not good because we want the oxygen to jump from hemoglobin into the tissues. Let's use a different number as an example to really solidify this concept in your head because it is difficult to understand sometimes. If we have a partial pressure of 20 in the tissues, we want as much oxygen going from the hemoglobin into the tissues so that we can generate energy. So if we're using a right shifted portion, 20% means that, hey, 20% of the oxygen stays with the hemoglobin and the rest goes to the tissues. So at this portion, 80% of oxygen goes from the hemoglobin to the tissues on the right shifted portion. So that must mean that the 80% of oxygen really loves, really loves the tissue. However, if we're using the left shifted portion at a partial pressure of 20, what do we get? Well, at a partial pressure of 20, we keep going up and up and up and up until we hit this section. And let's say it's 55. Let's say it's 55. So 55% of the oxygen stays with the hemoglobin. So that must mean that 45% of the hemoglo of the oxygen goes to the tissues compared to 80. So instead of 45% of oxygen, that's uh, represented in the left shifted portion. However, in the right shifted portion, we would have 80% of oxygen going towards the tissues. And that shows the disassociation of the oxygen and the hemoglobin. So again, left shifted means that the oxygen stays with the hemoglobin, and the right shifted portion means that the oxygen goes from the hemoglobin into the tissues. What are some of the factors that will increase the amount of oxygen leaving the hemoglobin. So what will help 
facilitate a right shifted curve? What will increase the right shiftedness of this curve? Well, we have to think intuitively. If we have too much carbon dioxide in the blood, well, we need to get more oxygen from the hemoglobin into the tissue because right now we're suffocating. And so if we have more carbon dioxide, we're gonna have more hydrogen ions, which equals a low, a low pH. And so that is the low pH. The low pH means that we have a high amount of carbon dioxide and we gotta get rid of this carbon dioxide. And therefore we have to increase the amount of oxygen leaving the hemoglobin. Therefore we have to do a right shifted curve. So these two play hand in hand, they go together. We also have the production of 2,3-biphosphoglycerate increasing the rate in which oxygen disassociates from hemoglobin. But what is 2,3-biphosphoglycerate? Well, 2,3-biphosphoglycerate is a product of the anaerobic metabolic pathway. And that occurs within the red blood cells. So that happens within the erythrocytes. Why does this happen? Well, the erythrocytes need energy. They need to survive. They're not just little particles inside the body that live forever and ever. No, they're replaced every 120 days. And so they need to eat, right? So they need to produce their own little ATP. The reason why they do the anaerobic, so let's say anaerobic pathway, is because they don't have mitochondria. They don't have nucleuses, they don't have ribosomes or organelles, and the reason why they don't have that is because when they're forming, they shoot out all their little organelles. And so the only thing that they can do to produce ATP is by the production of the anaerobic metabolic pathway, and that produces 2,3-biphosphoglycerate. And so 2,3, we could say 2,3-biphosphoglycerate, glycerate is going to increase the amount of oxygen that leaves leaves hemoglobin and now we have to ask ourselves what causes a left shifted curve and to think that we have to do the direct opposite of the right shifted curve so we have to increase the pH so we have to make the blood a lot more alkaline how do we do that we do that by decreasing, we decrease the carbon dioxide concentration. When we decrease the carbon dioxide concentration, we also decrease the hydrogen ion concentration, which increases the pH. So now we have a pH of, let's say, 9. But what does a low concentration of carbon dioxide mean? What does that mean for us? Well, that must mean that we have a high concentration of oxygen. So now we have to ask ourselves, why would I want to release oxygen into the tissues if there is already a lot of oxygen? That doesn't make any sense. Why would I want to release oxygen when there's already oxygen? Why would I want to buy food if I already have food at home? I don't have to be wasting my money. So let's hold this oxygen. Let's do a left shifted curve. Let's hold this oxygen into the hemoglobin. And a fun fact that you probably need to know for your classes, the relationship between the pH levels and the disassociation curve, that's called the Bohr. That's called the Bohr effect. Having a high pH, which means a low concentration of hydrogen atoms, that's going to make the oxygen not want to leave the hemoglobin. And therefore, we're going to have a left shifted curve. Low temperature can also prevent oxygen from leaving the hemoglobin. And I like to think of it as having a pot of water on the stove. So in a right shifted curve, the higher the temperature, the more oxygen you leave into the tissues, the more oxygen that escapes the hemoglobin. When you have this pot of water and you increase the temperature, eventually the water starts bubbling. And when it starts bubbling, you start seeing this water vapor, this steam come out. You can imagine the blood as the water and the hemoglobin as the pot. When you increase the temperature, the oxygen starts to come out of 
the hemoglobin. The water starts to boil out of the pot. And if we turn down the temperature, then the water kind of relaxes. It doesn't boil as much. It doesn't bubble. You have a decrease in the water vapor. Therefore, you also have a decrease in the amount of oxygen leaving that hemoglobin. And so if we decrease the pressure, or sorry, if we decrease the temperature, we will decrease the amount of oxygen leaving that hemoglobin. And if you want to think about it in physiology, when you're exercising, well, your body temperature also increases. And so that signals the body to send more oxygen into the muscle tissue that needs the oxygen because we're exercising. And so having an increase in temperature is going to increase the amount of oxygen leaving the hemoglobin into the muscle tissue. That, that allows the muscle tissue to grab oxygen and to feed itself and produce more energy. And now there is a special type of situation that we deal with. So people who are pregnant, they have a fetus developing, and this fetus actually has fetal hemoglobin. And this fetal hemoglobin is a lot different from adult hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin has a higher, has a higher affinity has a higher affinity for oxygen because instead of using its own lungs, the baby uses the mother's respiratory system to gain oxygen. And so the baby's hemoglobin is going to push the mother's hemoglobin and it's gonna snatch the oxygen from the mother's hemoglobin. And it's gonna say, hey, your oxygen is gonna go from the hemoglobin to my hemoglobin because I'm a baby and I'm more important I don't care about the mom's hemoglobin, I care about my hemoglobin, and my hemoglobin is more important. And so the hemoglobin for the fetal baby is going to be a lot more demanding. It's going to have a higher love for oxygen. And so therefore, the oxygen is very, very attached to this fetal hemoglobin. So the fetal hemoglobin will have a high affinity for this oxygen driving it into the left shifted curve because it really needs oxygen to develop as uh, a baby. There are three different ways in which carbon dioxide leaves the body. So carbon dioxide can use the erythrocytes, also known as red blood cells, as taxis. And so the first one is kind of like the taxi method. So we have the taxi. So carbon dioxide leaves the tissue and it's going to go into the red blood cell and it's just going to leave the body. So it's going to use the erythrocyte to go into the alveola and then be exhaled from the body. The next way that the carbon dioxide leaves the body is that it will enter the blood plasma. So the blood plasma is like 90% water. And so we have a lot of water inside this blood plasma and now we have carbon dioxide inside this blood plasma. When carbon dioxide combines with water, we have this formula. We will form carbonic acid, and carbonic acid is just H2CO3. It's just a combination of water and carbon dioxide. And we can also break this down into something different. We can create bicarbonate, bicarbonate, and that's gonna be negative. And we also have this release of a hydrogen atom. So now this plasma is slowly, slowly increasing in hydrogen concentration. When the hydrogen concentration increases, we have a decrease in the pH. And therefore, we have an acidic, we have acidic blood. So we have acidic blood. So that occurs in the plasma. So the more carbon dioxide you have, the more acidic your blood becomes. The more acidic the blood becomes, the more signals the chemoreceptors in the central and peripheral center send out. The more signals mean the more uh, respiratory rates we have. So what I'm trying to say is more carbon dioxide equals more signals from the chemoreceptors chemoreceptors and that must mean that we increase the respiratory rate which increases the oxygen concentration which decreases the carbon dioxide concentration which will decrease 
the hydrogen concentration, which will increase the pH to a normal level. So this formula is occurring in right here in this plasma. But notice we also have this formula occurring inside the erythrocyte, inside the red blood cell. So we have this formula occurring twice, one in the plasma and one in the red blood cell. Because we have this uh, reaction occurring inside the erythrocytes, we have an increase, we have an increase of bicarbonate right here inside the erythrocyte. So this concentration increases. You don't want to have a large concentration of bicarbonate inside the erythrocyte. You want everything to kind of remain normal. And so this bicarbonate is going to leave the erythrocyte. And instead, this little chloride ion is going to say, hey, we can change places. You can leave the erythrocyte and you can go inside the plasma, but instead I'm going to go inside the erythrocyte. And we call this a chloride, chloride shift. Now notice that the bicarbonate is negative and the chloride ion is also negative. So there is no gain in negativity. There is no gain in positivity. There is no change in electronegativity. Everything is neutral. You're just decreasing the concentration of bicarbonate within the erythrocyte and you're increasing the concentration of chloride within the erythrocyte. And before we move on, the process in which the carbon dioxide and water combine to form carbonic acid, that is facilitated by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. So we have carbonic, carbonic, carbonic anhydrase. So that's an enzyme that facilitates this reaction. And what I just described is called the bicarbonate buffer. So this is the bicarbonate buffer. And it actually buffers, it buffers the pH level of the blood. As the red blood cell arrives at the alveolus, it will start releasing this carbon dioxide and intake oxygen. So the carbon dioxide that just used the erythrocyte as a taxi, it will simply diffuse away. And so this concentration of carbon dioxide will decrease and the concentration of oxygen will increase. But what about the bicarbonate that is inside the red blood cell? So this section right here is going to be the red blood cell. So again, we have some bicarbonate ions, we have some hydrogen ions, and then we also have some chloride ions from the chloride shift that entered into the erythrocyte in exchange for a little bit of bicarbonate ions. What happens here is that we will have the conversion, we will have the conversion, so this occurs in the red blood cell, we will have the conversion of hydrogen plus bicarbonate plus bicarbonate to form water and also carbon dioxide. So when this happens, the carbon dioxide will leave the erythrocyte and will diffuse into the alveolus. And therefore, the concentration of carbon dioxide is going to decrease, is going to decrease. And again, this reaction is facilitated by uh, carbonic anhydrase, carbonic anhydrase. So we're just gonna pull this as Ca. So as this carbon dioxide concentration decreases, well, we still have the bicarbonate concentration inside the plasma. Why do we care about the bicarbonate concentration inside the plasma? It's not inside the erythrocyte, so why should we care? Well, as this carbon dioxide leaves, we have less and less concentration of bicarbonate inside the red blood cell. And so this bicarbonate says, hey, 
I see that the red blood cell has less and less bicarbonate, but I have a lot of bicarbonate inside the plasma. And so we can leave the plasma and we can enter the red blood cell. We can leave the plasma and enter the red blood cell. And so this guy right here is the plasma, plasma bicarbonate. That's a high concentration compared to the red blood cell because as the red blood cell moves around this alveolus, it loses more and more bicarbonate. But the plasma is still the same concentration. And so we go from a high concentration into a low concentration. So we move from the plasma into the red blood cell. As we do that, as we move from the red blood cell, so let's actually create a different picture. Here we have the cell. As we decrease the concentration of bicarbonate, as we decrease, we still have the plasmic bicarbonate. Bicarbonate. And that is increased. So we go from high to low, we're, we're gonna go here. But inside the red blood cell is this little chloride. So if we keep losing a negative bicarbonate, that's gonna be bad for the erythrocyte. And so instead, the chloride is going to go out right here, and we're gonna have another chloride shift, chloride shift. So now the chloride leaves the erythrocyte and the bicarbonate from the plasma goes into the red blood cell. So now what we have here, what we have here is that we're gonna have the initial hydrogen ions, ions adding with the new bicarbonate ions. And that forms, as you know, that forms something called, something called H2O and carbon dioxide. So now even more carbon dioxide can leave the red blood cell and go into the alveolus and diffuse out. It can be exhaled out. And now oxygen can go back into the erythrocyte and it can go into the uh, body tissues and feed the muscle tissues. And that's actually how the body breathes. And so we actually covered the respiratory system. We covered the lungs, the anatomy of the lungs, the physiology of the lungs, the way the body breathes and how hemoglobin associates with oxygen. And we did so much and it was really fun. So I'm, I'm really glad that you took the time out of your day to learn with me. That makes me happy. And it makes me happy to teach you. I'm so proud of you. I know it's difficult, but it's, it's, it's worth it. And I love you so much. It's almost midnight here, and I've been lecturing for about four hours. But I love what I do, and I hope that I can continue to do it. So thank you so much for the time that you spent with me, and for just being awesome. So thank you so much. I love you, and have a great day. Bye.